Welcome to the first aid guidelines presentation for the European Resuscitation Council for 2021. Let me uh, first introduce myself. I'm David Zyvon. I was chair of the ERC writing group for first aid guidelines. And this is my very, uh, very, very privileged group of uh, writers who assisted me in writing these guidelines and spent an immense amount of time getting them correct. I hope you like them. There is a conflict of interest statement from one of the guideline writers, Anthony Handley, and that's presented here. So let's get into the guidelines straight away. The first one is the recovery position. There is nothing new in the recovery position, uh, which has changed from the 2015 guidelines. And the important point to recognize is that there have been a number of uh, questions raised about when the recovery position is used. This has been made explicitly clear in the 2020 guidelines that if the casualty has a decreased level of responsiveness due to a medical illness or non-physical trauma and does not meet the criteria for the initiation of rescue breathing or chest compressions, then you should use the recovery position. The important point to re realize here is that they must not require CPR before you turn them. There have been a number of case reports where uh, people have been turned into the recovery position when they actually needed resuscitation. We know that the recognition of stroke, and specifically the early recognition of stroke, is vitally important uh, for the improved recovery of stroke symptoms. So the use of a stroke scale, which will help uh, in the early recognition of stroke, is very important. And we recommend uh, one of four stroke scales, fast, facial arm uh, speech time, CPSS, Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale, LAPSS, the Los Angeles Pre-Hospital Stroke Screen, and MASS, the Melbourne Ambulance Stroke Screen, as one of the four scales that could be used. They are of increasing complexity, but most of them use uh, the facial arm speech time parameters uh, to allow them uh, to proceed. In addition, you can use uh, blood glucose measurement with laps and mass to increase the specificity of the scale. Anaphylaxis. Vitally important that we get the treatment of anaphylaxis and specifically the early treatment correct. What we concentrated on here was that not the initial treatment of anaphylaxis, but the importance of being able to admi administer a second dose of adrenaline after the five minutes after the first dose had been given. Or when the, if the symptoms start to return after the first injection. So the guideline states administer a second dose of intramuscular adrenaline by auto injector after five minutes or when the symptoms return. And this has now just recently been uh, supported by a statement recommending that people carry two auto injectors, not just one. And there may be a case for uh, further injections, a third, fourth, fifth or sixth until the symptoms resolve. Management of heat stroke by cooling. So this may seem rather peculiar uh, to talk about as we're recording this uh, at the present time in the winter when it's extremely cold. But heat stroke by cooling is a very important topic and recognizing heat stroke is extremely important. When you recognize heat stroke, uh, especially exertional or non-exertional heat stroke, where the temperature is suspected about, uh, above, to be above 40 degrees core temperature, uh, at, uh, it's important uh, to immediately remove the casualty from the heat source, commence passive cooling, and then add additional cooling techniques uh, which may be available. So probably the most important of these is whole body cold water immersion in water between one and 26 degrees. It's interesting that water between one and five degrees is probably the most effective but the next most effective temperature range is between 20 and 25 degrees. And then it varies between 14 and 17 and eight to 12 degrees. So the water doesn't have to be ice. 
but it has to be cold. And whole body cold water immersion involves the torso uh, as, as well as much of the body as you can get in, but not obviously the head. If you haven't got cold water, then ice packs to the axilla, groin and neck is uh, important and using cold showers actually at about 20 degrees is very effective as well. Ice sheets or towels, misting and fanning does work, but uh, evaporative cooling, uh, in other words, wetting and just, just fanning them basically, is probably less effective uh, than passive cooling. So these techniques are important. And I will add one other comment here. It's not as if you will not know that basically heat stroke is at risk. The temperature has to be hot, the humidity probably high. So this is a, a, you can predict that this could be a medical complication that if you are covering, for example, um, a sports event, that, that this may be one of the um, illnesses that you may come across and you should be prepared for it. Presyncope. So presyncope is an interesting condition. It actually is the pre-start or the uh, comes before syncope, which in many common terms is called fainting. So syncope occurs for about 30% of people admitted to the emergency room. It's actually much more common than people realize, and it occurs in 50% of females and about 25% of males in during uh, any one lifetime. Presyncope, or the symptoms that occur before syncope or fainting occur, are the uh, lightheadedness, nausea, sweating, black spots in front of the eyes, and an impending loss of consciousness. And what you want to do is prevent the collapse actually occurring, which can result in fractures and even intracranial hemorrhages, basically. So anything that will present the, prevent this is important. Sitting the person down straightening away, straight away, having recognized it, but also if they can't sit down, physical, simple counter pressure maneuvers, such as um, lower body maneuvers of squatting, uh, squatting cross-legged, etc., will prevent uh, fainting or syncope. So pre-syncopal maneuvers can pre present, prevent collapse. Control of severe life-threatening bleeding. Again, this hasn't really changed from the 2015 guideline. However, ILCOR uh, did conduct, and ILCOR was the body that has been un underpinning all of these procedures with the um, consensus on science um, presentations. ILCOR did a, a major uh, review of life-threatening bleeding reviewing all the various types of controlling of that life-threatening bleeding. What it's come out with is, as I've said, very similar to the 2015 guideline, and it follows three very simple instructions. You should apply direct manual pressure with a clean sterile dressing for the initial control of severe life-threatening bleeding. And if you've got a hemostatic dressing, you can apply the direct manual pressure using the hemostatic dressing as well. The third point is to the use of manufactured tunicates uh, for controlling life-threatening bleeding in wounds uh, which are amenable to the application of a tunicate, such as an arm or a leg. These tunicates have to be applied correctly and once applied should be left in place until they, the wound and the bleeding has been assessed uh, by a medical expert. cervical spine motion restriction and stabilization. Again, this has not changed since the 2015 guideline, <clears throat> excuse me. And the routine application of a cervical collar by a first aid provider is not recommended in the 2020 guidelines either. However, having said that, and you may have a person with a painful neck or a suspected cervical spine injury, it's important to understand what you can do. So, as a result of a number of searches, the panel has recommended that in the awake or alert casualty with a suspected cervical spine injury, you should encourage the casualty to self-maintain their neck in a stable position. In other words, they can hold their neck and probably much more effectively than you can hold their head and neck in position in a stable position 
because they will understand their movements as opposed to following your movements when you decide to make them. In the unconscious or uncooperative casualty, you may consider um, stabilizing the neck using a head squeeze, that's placing the hands on the head and holding the head steady, or the trapezium squeeze, where you actually place the hands on the shoulders of the patient and squeeze the neck and squeeze the head uh, between your arms, basically, to immobilize it. These need practice, they need cooperation, and it's not easy to do. However, using a cervical collar has been shown to cause more damage because for those who are inexperienced at applying collars, uh, they often manipulate the neck more uh, when trying to apply that collar. Cooling of thermal burns, a, a really interesting topic, uh, which has caused a lot of controversy. So the initial treatment is to remove from the heat source, that sounds very obvious, immediately commence to cool the burn with cool or cold water. And then we come to the con controversial issue, continuing cooling the burn for at least 20 minutes. So the time for cooling has been controversial for some time. In the 2015 guidelines, on the evidence we had at the time, uh, we considered that 10 minutes was adequate. However, current research has shown that if you recommend 10 minutes, people seem to do less than 10 minutes, and therefore we needed to recommend a longer time to ensure that they performed adequate cooling of the burn. So 20 minutes of cooling, followed by loosely covering the burn with a dry sterile dressing or cling wrap. This subject is under current review and will be, uh, rev uh, will be and a paper will be published in the next year uh, looking at the time course again. Finally, compression wrap for closed extremity joint injury. So this is again an interesting topic as it's quite common for people uh, to have a joint injuries. If the casualty is experiencing pain in the joint, or pain on movement, encourage them not to move that joint to demonstrate the pain. However, there is no evidence to support the simple application of a compression wrap as a single intervention. We'd rather say, but we don't have the evidence to support recommending some progression of treatments such as RICE, which is rest, ice, compression, and elevation, rather than a single intervention but this would come down to local guidelines and will have to be uh, investigated in further studies. There are many other first aid topics which are included in the 2020 guidelines, 2021 guidelines. These are important and you can see them listed here. This presentation doesn't allow me time to go through them, but if you would like to look at them in more detail, you should go to the 2021 guidelines where you will see them presented in a short format at the beginning of the guideline paper and in a much longer explanatory format towards the end of the paper. If you want more details, you can refer to the co-stars as published by ILCOR on the ILCOR website. Thank you very much for watching this lecture and participating in the 2021 guidelines uh, conference.